things are a little dark, a little underexposed, because I've already exposed the world of Ryzen 3000. We're gonna take a look at the MSI Meg X570 Ace, because if everything's not aces, it's spades, right? Although that implies that spades are bad and aces are good, but there's ace, aces of spades. No, really, actually, I think it's more like, I think it's more like the episode of Deep Space Nine where like they've mined the wormhole and uh, the the enemy's gonna come through the wormhole if the, you know, they manage to take down the minefield and that would be bad and the enemy's working on taking down the minefield and, uh, you know, the resistance on the inside figures out how to prevent them from taking down the minefield and they succeed just a hair too late. So like, you know, it's really suspenseful and it's like, oh, the heroes are gonna definitely prevent them from taking down the minefield. Not so much, no. It's like Rom was in there and he's like, done. Oh, too late. <laughs> uh, he doesn't know. So yeah, it's kind of like that. AMD literally made this amazing, amazing product. And then there's some stumbles out the gate and frustration for everybody. But I think, uh, you know, still not as bad as the X99 launch, probably not as bad as the X299 launch, but you know, who's keeping score? I keeping score. I digress. It's basically stabilized at this point. Although I don't know that I would advertise the rise in boost speeds and things like that. I'm really doing a terrible job selling probably the most amazing processor in 10 years. I mean, if you get excited about computer processors, the Ryzen 3000 series is like the computer processor to get excited about, at least until Threadripper 3, which is gonna devour whole the entire high-end desktop market, I think. But yeah, I mean, it really is an amazing product. And most of the troubles have really just been around polish and testing and integration and things that, <laughs> problems of scale. It's like, oh man, now that I suddenly have billions upon billions of dollars, I'm gonna have to hire people to manage the money. Oh, I don't, that's not even first world problems. I don't know what to call that. That's basically what I'm talking about. And if, you, if you've been living under a rock and you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It's basically fine, everything's good. The bad news is you are gonna have to update your UEFI pretty much out the gate on all of these boards. And the version that you're looking for, at least as of the time of this video, is 1.0.0.3 ABB. And that version is actually buggy, but it's not as buggy as the older versions. So what happened was the older versions of the UEFIs and, and, and stuff provided by AMD, not the board partners. So like MSI doesn't have anything to do with this. They don't have a lot of transparency into it. The controversy is that the older versions would boost to higher clocks, including the, the speeds printed on the box. And so I've been running Geekbench while we've been talking, and I can see that actually I did boost to 4.4 gigahertz on a few cores, but most of the other cores were like 4.3 gigahertz and less. So not the best situation. Geekbench detects this as a 4.35 gigahertz processor. It is in fact a 4.4 gigahertz processor on the box. I did in fact hit 4.4 gigahertz with the 1.0.0.3 ABB BIOS, which just came out a day ago from the time that I'm filming this, which is also the reason that some of our X570 coverage has been delayed. <sighs> I'm gonna have to put that disclaimer in like all the AMD videos, aren't I? That's really gonna suck. I don't, <sighs> why? Uh, he doesn't know. It's like the Deep Space Nine thing, it really is. So, yeah, anyway. MSI has done an amazing job engineering this board. It is very solidly constructed. It is very well laid out, and especially like the PCI Express layout and cooling. So with X570, everything's PCI Express 4. PCI Express 4 is gonna generate a lot of heat. That means that the chipset's gonna get hot. That means that you know other parts of the board potentially are gonna get hot, and this motherboard will happily support up to the 16 core 3950X. 30, 16 cores on AM4, that's crazy. Uh, the PCI Express 4 SSDs also get quite hot. So the layout here is really good. We've got three PCI Express by 16 slots. This is a by 16, by zero, by four, or by eight, by eight, by four. The layout here means that your primary X16 slot has enough room for a triple slot graphics card. So any kind of graphics card that you're gonna be running, you're gonna have plenty of room for it to breathe. The other, uh, the final very bottom X16 slot, it's also PCI Express 4, it's serviced by the chipset. 
The bottom M.2 on this motherboard, the very bottom one, is serviced by the CPU. The two on top are serviced by the chipset. That's kind of a weird situation. At least I'm pretty sure that's how it is because that's how it is on the godlike. So I'm pretty sure that's how it is on the Ace in terms of layout and ferreting through uh, LS Topo to get a layout of the system. If I'm wrong about that, this is also a really cool situation because of the fan placement. This is one of the only boards that places the PCI Express 4 chipset fan far away from the graphics card. So if you've got a huge chunk graphics card, it is not in any way going to interfere with the airflow around the chipset. Although I think that like in practice and testing that, as long as you've got decent airflow in your case, like the placement of the fan really didn't matter too much. Uh, again, it depends on your graphics card and some other parameters. If there's hardly any airflow in your case, then it would be a bad situation for you because the exhaust from your graphics card would go into the chipset. But as long as you have front intake fans or front fans that are moving air, not really an issue. It's kind of a meme. So in terms of connectivity at the back, we've got our Wi-Fi 6. Yes, this motherboard's got Intel Wi-Fi 6. Got our PS2 keyboard port, which is great for me because and then we've got a plurality, a mix of USB 3, 5 gigabit, and 10 gigabit ports. This motherboard actually has five 10 gigabit USB ports. One for the front type C, one rear type C, and then the rest are type A, which is really pretty awesome. We've got optical SPDIF and gold plated audio connections on the relatively high end Realtek ALC 1220 based audio codec that is implemented on this motherboard. If you're into the RGB-ness, it's got the Corsair header, it's got digital headers, it's got other RGB headers, and it also has the MSI Ace like mirror, infinity mirror thing. And of course, all of this is controlled by the MSI Mystic Light software. Um, one thing I'll mention real quick on the chipset fan, it is zero frozer, which means that it will turn off when the chipset is under a certain temperature threshold. So if you think you might be annoyed by a tiny little fan trying to move air, well, it does, you, you do have the option of setting it to turn off below a temperature threshold, the zero frozer. So depending on what BIOS you're running and some profiles, you'll get that out of the box, but you can also configure it in the UEFI for fan interfaces. In terms of power delivery, dual eight pin. You don't really need dual eight pin, especially on the AM4 CPUs. They are not gonna draw enough power to overload a single eight pin connector. That said, some motherboards will actually use that interface, the power interface for more than just the CPU because the only other source of 12 volts on the board is the ATX24 connector, which only has two 12 volt wires, which is, you know, you can deliver about 75 watts per wire. Well, 75 watts conservatively uh, per wire. So supplying power to the graphics cards, especially if you're gonna try to run a three graphics card, can get a little dicey if they're all using that 75 watts from the PCIe slot. That's a, that's a story, that's a video for another day is what that is. There's also a heat pipe connecting the chipset, which I thought was a very pragmatic solution that runs up by the RAM, connects to the VRM, and then connects to the chunk of aluminum heat sink thing that's at the you know, back of the thing, the rear IO shield, which by the way, the rear IO shield is built in. Nice chut. Like I said, MSI did a really good job with the engineering on this one this time around. This has the game boost, also known as the spinal tap knob. It goes up to 11. So um, you can overclock with that. Although really, like it does work, you can overclock, but like the 3700X is so well bend by AMD, you're not gonna get much overclocking. Like it's, it's not gonna go well for you. The 3800 overclocks the best. The 3900, it's hit and miss. You're really better off doing the per core overclocking with the 3900X because 3900X has one good chiplet and one kind of meh chiplet. The meh chiplet is bent somewhere between the 3600 and the 3600X. So it's pretty meh. But the primary chiplet, the first chiplet on the 3900X, it's pretty decent. You can hit 4.5 gigahertz on it, you know, all core, no problem. But you're gonna be using Ryzen Master to configure that. So the, the 1 to 11 thing, let's call that reserved for future use in hoping that AMD will make the software for overclocking a little bit better. In terms of 
other features of this motherboard. It doesn't have a, a back plate or anything like that. The back of the motherboard is actually quite clean, which is good because some manufacturers have been putting heat producing components on the back of the motherboard, which is a bit questionable in, in my opinion. Overall, the motherboard's pretty stable. Our Geekbench run just now on the 3700X at completely stock settings except for XMP is 5221 and a 29586 score. Although I just realized that that's not gonna work. That's actually wrong because I'm only running one stick of our G-Skill Trident Z Royal. Now, if I were building the system over again today, I would be using the Trident Z Neo. Trident Z Neo is the current stuff. Royal is kind of on its way out because it's been around for a while. 3600, 3600 is the sweet spot. If you are having trouble hitting your boost clocks, you might target 3533. This particular 3700X looks like it's gonna have no problem hitting 4.4, at least on two cores. Uh, with 3600, but that hasn't been the case for every 3700 that I've tested. So the overclocking is kind of weird. If you haven't seen my other videos on that, you should check that out. We're just, just sticking to the motherboards here. In terms of Linux support, Linux support is pretty good out of the box on these. On the newer UEFIs, you have great IO MMU separation. All of your M.2s, each one is in their own group. The PCI Express X16, X16 slots are in their own groups, even the one serviced by the chipset. The peripherals that are off of the, the chipset, some of the SATA, some of the USB, all of those are only in one IOMMU group. So like things that were like part of the legacy chipset on X470s, like some USB, some SATA, that kind of thing. All of that is in one IOMMU group. But anything that's interfacing directly to the CPU has been separated, which is great because you can run VFIO on this pretty easily then and give your virtual machine on Linux, you know, a dedicated NVMe if you want. Dedicated USB in some cases because this thing has a lot of USB peripherals. You can also do a PCI Express by one add-in card, which I've got laying here somewhere. And because those PCI Express by one slots go through the chipset, you can get isolation for your add-in USB cards. Of course, don't just add any USB card. Certain USB cards are better than others for IOMMU. Come to the level one form if you're gonna do that and you're not sure what to do that. That doesn't really 100% doesn't really belong in this video. So, final verdict. Good job, MSI. Uh, during the whole Agiza debacle, MSI was one of the companies that was lagging behind in terms of like constant updates for the UEFI, but we can't really blame the AIB partners for that because qualifying a UEFI is really a lot of work. And so MSI behind the scene, I asked them about it, MSI behind the scenes was doing a lot of work to make sure that the uh, firmware for the processor from AMD was bug free. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't. So not a lot of, you know, daily BIOS updates. Other motherboard vendors took the other strategy, which is, hey, we're just gonna update it as soon as we get it from AMD, which is also fine, but that, that means the users are the guinea pigs. So which do you prefer? Again, like I say, these are problems where it's like, oh, suddenly we have billions of dollars because our product is amazing. And uh, we need to hire more smart people to help us solve these problems before it gets out the door, which is a good problem to have. Like I say, re most revolutionary desktop consumer CPU, mm, probably 10 years. Good job, AMD. Good job, MSI, putting it together. Thanks, I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been an, an Meg X570 Ace motherboard review. Woo! Oh, it's plugged in. Whoops. Oh no.